Hello, this is Steve, and I'm recording again from our backyard here in Troy, Illinois. Uh, this is a short one today. This is actually article. I used to write a monthly article for the monthly newsletter that I did way up north a long time ago. Uh, I've included this in various other writings and sermons, so some of it might be familiar if you follow me, but this is the original. Change for just uh, some of the dates. And since it's an article, there's no actual scripture that goes with it, so we just jump right into it. <clears throat> Nick coming, Dad. I wasn't quite asleep yet, but I was headed there. What? I asked. Nate coming, Dad. Nate coming. My three-year-old son and I were spending the weekend with my mother and her husband at the trailer they owned and kept at a campground in Missouri. He and I were just settling in for the night when he sat upright and pointed down the covers Nate coming. I rode over to look and saw an inchworm making its way towards the pillows. Trying very hard not to laugh, I reassured him that it was only an inchworm and nothing to worry about. Then scooped it up and threw it outside. Thus reassured, we both settled in and went to sleep. Though very intelligent for his age, after all, I am his father, Ted's vocabulary at three years of age just did not have enough words in it yet to fully describe what it was he was seeing. The word he did know that most closely described it was snake. He had seen them at the zoo and read about them in some of his books. And he knew that some snakes were dangerous. Hence, his insistence on getting my attention focused on what was steadily approaching up the sheet. Fast forward a few years. I once had an opportunity to address a group of junior high students and their teacher as I explained the mechanics and theory behind the giant wooden turntable that drives the carting mill in the village at New Salem State Park. And as they all walked away, I could tell from their comments that they had understood what I'd been telling them and were amazed at how everything had been put together to work with ox power. However, I couldn't help but think that some, if not most, of them were still wondering why they hadn't just installed an electric motor. They understood the nuts and bolts of the machinery, but were unable to deal with the concept of there ever having been a time when something like that was not only necessary, but would have been considered high technology. Unfortunately, most of that same way of thinking has permeated the way youth and many adults perceive religion and moral values. 
through the magic of modern technological advances, miracles occur around us every day. Imagine the pioneer of nine decades ago walking into a modern home and seeing a television picture. A doctor transported from a Civil War era surgery into one of today's medical marvels. Or a mule skinner, that's a teamster, suddenly seeing a 747 overhead. These things which we take so much for granted would surely seem to be miracles to our forefathers. Yet to us, they are just part of our everyday life, with more miracles being invented every day. Is it any wonder then that many of our generation, let alone our youth, have a problem dealing with the miracles and stories that we read about in the Bible as being anything too special. Note these statistics. Who cheats on tests? 74% of Christian youth, 76% of non-Christian youth. Who lies to their parents? 93% of Christian youth, 93% of non-Christian youth. Who physically hits someone when angered? 63% of Christian youth, 67% of non-Christian youth. Source of that is the Ethics of American Youth Survey. The point is, there is little or no difference between our kids who are called Christian and non-believers. And that is because we have failed in passing on to them the full context and meaning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is at least partly because for all intents and purposes, many of us have failed ourselves to grasp the full import of Christ's message. For the most part, Many in the church today, including our youth, have not been taught any of the heavy ideas and ideals of religion. They have learned what I have termed religion light. Yet, since the only word in most vocabularies that came close to describing it was religion, that's what most assumed they were learning. But the numbers in the survey above tell a different story. When I went on my walk to Emmaus many years ago, one speaker told us that when the church loses the word sin from its vocabulary, it loses the very language of salvation. You see, sin and order are directly related. Our God is a God of order. So in its simplest term, 
Sin is merely a case of getting things out of the order that God intended for them to be. And a person must truly study and learn his word to be aware of what that order is. Without that awareness, right and wrong both become gray, not the black and white that they should be. We must all search out the truth, the order, if you will, of God's plan and return to the basic principles and concepts that Jesus strove so hard to make known to us. Because without a knowledge, a knowledge of and belief in the basics, any lessons learned will be false or worse, only partly true. And there is no such thing as a partial Christian. That would kind of be like being partly pregnant. Let all of God's people say, Amen.